That's all I can say after watching that. They didn't actually put a real helmet there on the ground and filmed it. We're seeing a bit of a distortion here that isn't physically accurate to what the helmet is, would actually do. Mark Hamill was filmed. He was actually there. They didn't use any of it. Today's episode is brought to you by Raycon. Stick around to the end to see how you can get 15% off your pair of premium wireless earbuds. Welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artists React. We're here on the couch with Nico and Sam. I'm very excited about some of the stuff that we're gonna be looking at today. Did you guys ever see the clip from Star Trek where they stabilized all the camera shakes? I have. <laughs> can you pull it up real quick, Christian? Shields at maximum, full reverse. <laughs> Dude, look at, how, look at that grip he's got on the chair, though. <laughs> it's like if the ship moves this much every time it's shot. <laughs> 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 Can you put some sparks? <laughs> some sparks in here? <laughs> anyway. So Disney came out with the behind the scenes of The Mandalorian where they took a look at how they did the effects for the digital Luke Skywalker. And if you remember back in January, we took our own crack at this with some deep fakes. It was an amazing time doing that video. I mean, hey, Mark Hamill, he not only watched our video, he had some constructive criticism about our marketing attitude. Yeah. <laughs> Having a little bit of just arrogance by being like, we beat Disney, and then Mark Hamill's all like, maybe you shouldn't say that. <laughs> he did not grant us the rank of master, and we were like, what? And he's like, you need to learn humility, and we're like, okay. Mark Hamill did personally respond to Dean, and that totally made Dean's month, year, I don't know, like. His eyes were getting watery. There's a Crew Cuts episode about it, but that's the kind of righteous dude that Mark Hamill is. The Luke Skywalker effect. You know, that's ballsy to go out and do a shot like that for a show like this with the amount of time they have and, you know, the amount of resources they can throw at it. It's not at all like a giant feature film. Not a lot of time to just yeah. recreate something that's going to be scrutinized by millions of people. So we took our guesses at how they did the de-aged Luke Skywalker, but they were all just guesses. So now they just drop the behind the scenes and they cover how they did that effect. So let's see how close we were to getting it right. So first off, Mark Hamill was filmed. He was actually there. Doesn't mean they used him for the actual shot. My guess is that they didn't use any of it. I think it was probably just for moral support for the crew and post team, but also just inspiration for like, what should this moment look like from the man himself? We always talk about shooting reference. It's like, oh, you're gonna put an explosion and have a real explosion or something like that, you know, to reference. And like, this is the same thing for acting. If you're going to play a young Luke Skywalker, get the man who played Luke Skywalker to show you how to do it. Yeah. The amount of morale uplift from having the Luke Skywalker on set, it just motivates them to up their own game. So I think it's, even though it's intangible, you get this overall lift in quality that's hard to measure just by having his presence. Oh, interesting. So they're actually deep faking the third Luke Skywalker onto the first Luke Skywalker. Because Mark Hamill is actually kind of a very different person between the first and third Star Wars movies. And so what we're seeing right here is they're experimenting by taking the third one and putting it on the first one. <laughs> There's all their uh, face extraction sets. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we should. Y'all want to rip that? <laughs> Wow, they have all this archival footage to use. Dude, they got like the original like outtakes and whatnot. So much, so much data that they can just have. With where deepfake technology was at that point, it was, it was felt as though, you know, we really needed to kind of rely a little bit more on the tried and true techniques. So they backed off of deepfakes, interesting. So does this mean they went with Lola to actually do a lot of this yeah, then? Yeah, Lola, the, Lola did the effect. I mean, Lola is pretty much the leading master at de-aging technology. We've talked about Lola and their de-aging effects on episodes in the past. They're very good at it. So it's still very confusing. They're like, so we did a bunch of deepfake stuff, and then we tried a bunch of different other stuff using this other actor. I think, I think this is the closest we're going to get to seeing how they did it. Bing, bing, bong, 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 ding, 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 ding. It's like, whoa! Whoa, that's so much more work! <laughs> what did you do? There's like 20 passes happening. Oh my gosh. Maybe, did they start with a deep fake and then did just augment it to high heaven? That's a deep fake. Yeah. We can tell because of the way like the peripheral of that square is like kind of generated. It's got that weird like painterly look to it that is just AI just like, eh. It. So it is a deep fake. Kind of. Kind it's a deep fake with about 30 layers of nuke on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of nuance to what is happening in this behind the scene because they're not going to go deep into this and tell you 
that Mark Hamill didn't play young Luke Skywalker. But they are pointing out that they did have Mark Hamill on set, both as a respect for what he's brought to the character, mm -hmm. as well as a way to show that he was involved in actually directing this other actor to give us a Luke Skywalker. It's not like they're just, you know, somehow generating a 3D model of Mark Hamill's face going whoop and like making it younger and sticking it back on the other actor. It's really just for reference. I think the only actual thing in the final product that you're seeing is they filmed the young actor who's took his, taken his cues from both the director as well as Mark Hamill, and they looks like they did a deep fake. They're then going in and layering and layering and layering and layering a whole bunch of hand base compositing on top of it, which really does help take the deep fake to a level that works for television and high-end you know, film, but it also kind of disrupts the photorealism of it. Because when an artist has to go in and put 30 you know, brush strokes on by hand, it's not going to be that mathematically perfect computer algorithm spitting out an image. It's going to be the interpretation of a bunch of different compositing artists. But it also looks crisp. It looks clean. There's no bugs. It's not like his, you know, his teeth have melded into one giant white bar in his mouth or his eyes go boop, boop, every once in a while. <laughs> like in our old Tom Cruise deep fake. He's yeah. like, hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> <laughs> on the side, the side and back. Does it look like a photoreal young Luke Skywalker? No, but it looks great. Huge props to them for actually doing a deep fake. Like all the Mandalorian is just like, you know, pioneering visual effects stuff. The volume capture, like, I bet you there's gonna be so much more deep fake Luke Skywalker and the next season. Oh yeah. ILM actually hired Shamook, one of the leading deepfake artists on the internet, to continue their deepfake research, which like literally is like, that was the best move they could have possibly made. Like that was a smart decision. Because you know, even if you don't use your deepfakes to the final effect, it is amazing reference. They actually did this for the Irishman, where they basically created an AI that would pull out faces of Robert De Niro from a whole library of movies, and it'd give you the angle and the lighting to pick, like, put against the shot with your CG head so you can look at the real thing and the CG thing and see how close they were. So even if you're not using it, it's still an awesome reference to have. Props to the team for actually releasing this, because... Yeah. If like the amount of views this show gets is any sign of people's interest in how films are made, I think you know like we need more of this. We, oh, like, absolutely! Like, it's 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 so rough. Each time we see something super cool and have to basically guess how things are. I mean, they're educated guesses, but it's so nice to be able to actually watch the behind the scenes with you guys and actually break it down together. John Favreau and Dave Filoni and all the whole rest of the team on The Mandalorian. We're just doing an amazing job with this show. Surprise! Hey guys, how's it going? I hope you're enjoying the episode. Well, we've got a bonus secret scene available just on the website, CorridorDigital.com. Okay, enjoy the rest of the episode. I'm going to get back down here. Bye. This is suicide. Well, that's kind of our thing. So this movie's great. There's great visual effects all over the place. And so on Twitter, someone tagged me in a, in a question to James Gunn saying, Hey, how did you do this shot? And I was like, ha, 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 I know. <laughs> it's a true creative use of visual effects and live action footage. Then we got Michael Cena. <laughs> Michael Cena, he was in Arrested Development. Michael Cena. <laughs> oh, God dang it. Oh. <laughs> so okay. here we go. Oh Here. yeah, look at that. That's a, that's a helmet. That's chrome, where you don't see any sort of camera in the that's reflections. Cool. And you can even see the shadows of them moving around a little bit on the ground. Yeah. A little bit as they're, they're nearby it. Yeah. They didn't actually put a real helmet there on the ground and filmed it, because then you would have to paint out the camera. And obviously the camera would then be blocking the entire scene happening directly behind the camera. There is a classic issue when you are making a film and you have to deal with reflective objects. It's like, how do you hide the camera and the crew and all that stuff? You know, you look at the, the sunglasses in the Matrix, you know, and very frequently it's people just like wearing like a black cloak over their head, you know, and a tiny lens is sitting there and you just hope that it's, you're dark enough to not be seen. Um, this is the ultimate challenge of space movies. You think zero gravity is a tough visual effect? Try taking camera out of every spaceman's reflective visor. Exactly, right? <laughs> Did they just throw out a 360 camera and then map the reflection onto a 3D object? I think it was even easier than that. They could have used a 360 camera, but I'm willing to bet they straight up had the scene play out with an actual cinema camera on the ground looking up at them, mm -hmm. that they can then just project out onto a dome that we then see rendered out as a reflection. So it's like we got the camera, 
filming a scene. That scene is then placed in 3D space with a digital camera then looking at the helmet, which is reflecting the actual filmed element behind it. So everything that we're seeing here is very easy to do. Not gonna lie. <laughs> I say it's easy to do, but they excelled at making this good for a lot of like the small details, like the actual proper distortion of the helmet. It's not perfectly round. There's actually like some rippling to it. The, the actual environmental shadows on the ground around the helmet. We're seeing a bit of a distortion here that isn't physically accurate to what the helmet is, would actually do. If you were filming a reflection, the bloom would not be in the reflection outside of, you know, just maybe some surface imperfections or smearing on the surface. The bloom happens when the light enters the lens of the camera. So if you look at John Cena there, there's bloom wrapping around him from that light. That's an effect that happens when light hits the lens of the camera. It's not an effect that happens on the surface of a helmet, unless you have smears per se. But that's a different kind of bloom than like the glow of light going into a camera lens. Oh, you see it on the light on the right too. Like as it starts yeah. curving see, with the reflection, you yeah, see the, the, bloom, the bloom starts curving. Which wouldn't be how that light would actually go. That being said, it doesn't take away from it the does shot. It does not yeah. at all. This is like that's that's such a nitpicky <laughs> thing for, because at the end of the day, the most important part of this entire shot is the fight between those two guys and keeping the viewers in the moment yeah. while also having a kick-ass shot. Yeah, the effects are great. It's a great movie. The action's awesome. Hey, so I would like your suggestion for movies that we should revisit and talk about other scenes in. So we've talked about a lot of movies in the show. Yeah. Is there anything we should go back to and revisit a different scene from? Please leave a suggestion down below. Dude, I, I honestly really want to look at Pirates of the Caribbean again. We looked at Davy Jones and then the guy who actually made Davy Jones' eyes reached out to us and was like, you did it wrong. <laughs> yeah. So a big movie that we've never actually taken a look at is War of the Worlds from 2005, starring Tom Cruise and directed by Steven Spielberg. This movie kind of got greenlit and put into production like very rapidly. Like Steven Spielberg and Tom Cruise, their schedules just happened to line up. So it was like, oh, we're doing a movie. And they basically had to have the movie made in like less than a year. And so in order wow. to make that happen, ILM had to work really quickly. It ended up becoming the tightest deadline in ILM's history huh. for like four or 500 shots, they only had a few months to do everything. So, this was the first movie Steven Spielberg used previs instead of storyboards for. Mm. And so that they were able to kind of get a good idea of the pacing and layout of the movie ahead of time so that in conjunction with filming, the artists at ILM could start developing assets, start planning out shots. That's crazy looking. Right? Those are digital effects. Like that CGI, that's some amazing CGI physics. And I recently rewatched this and just like that blew my mind. It looks, looks great. so good. Classic blockbusters might show this from a very different angle and yet we're seeing it from a very challenging perspective. There is no motion control on this set. It's all very just organic handheld motion. Dude, the edge blur is so strong in this movie right <laughs> yeah. now though. Honestly, for how good everything is, the edge feather is like unfortunately just janky. It is so extreme. Like this guy right here. And then also when he's like running away from the house blowing up and stuff. Get out, get out, get out. This is like probably the most iconic shot from the entire movie. So much so that it was like the shot used in the Super Bowl commercial. Damn, looks so good. Damn, look at those physics sims. Sorry, that's all I can say after watching that. Do you see the house is friggin' lift? <laughs> like there's a moment right before the bloom hits. It's like, yeah, look at that. It's like, like you're saying, the physics sims are incredible. Is there like, are you about to like, turns out they're models. Yeah, it was all miniature work. Oh. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> that's so cool. Cause like these days you can replicate that level of detail with like a Houdini sim and a lot of time in rendering, sure. But you know, back then, this is you know 2004 that they're working on it, 2005 that it came out, they didn't have the tools that could do that level of you know, destruction. The bridge was a miniature? No, you pointed out the one CG element. The bridge was CG, the cars on the bridge were CG, all of the houses and all of the debris that you're seeing was actual like exploded model work. I cannot believe it. And then, of course, all of the digital compositing that goes in to bring all this together. I am so spoiled by CG to think that there's no way you could get that high detail of a house explosion with miniatures. 
Because usually when you see miniatures, you're like, okay, usually they're cool, but they're, they don't have that like every plank of a house kind of yeah. just just barfing wood and debris kind of feeling. That's usually something you see with a complex like physics simulation in CG. So for that bridge shot, what was crazy about it is that they literally came up with the idea for it, shot it, finished it all in a month so that they could deliver it for the Super Bowl commercial. Wow. It's and a great it's like, shot. It's so, so dynamic. This is like the epitome of what an amazing shot looks like. There's one more shot that I think blew me away when I saw it, because it was a one -er. And what I mean by that is basically just one long continuous shot as this car is driving down the highway. I think something like nine different shots were married together for the sequence that ends up being two and a half minutes long. There is a lot that went into this. So let's try to consider everything that is involved for a shot like this. First, they're filming these guys in a car on a blue screen. CG reflections on glass. Yeah, all of the glass is CG. All of the reflections on the glass have to be rendered out. They even have little subtle things like all of like the, the schmutz on the windshield just out of the eyeline of the actors. Yeah. But enough to be there to be like, there's a windshield, but also all of the background footage. What they actually did was they put a bunch of cameras on, I think like a Jeep or something like that, and literally just like drove it down the road, capturing background plates from a bunch of different angles that they're putting in the background of each of these shots. So I don't know what kind of stretch of road they have, but I'm willing to bet they probably are reusing the same stretch of road for different parts of the sequence. You're right, there's the bus again. The bus repeated itself. They just scooby-dooed themselves. Rachel, they probably turned around. I know! And then of course, then it ends, and then it flawlessly transitions to a real van driving off into the distance. This is just such classic Spielberg here, you know, where it's like he's making a dynamic setup, but it's focused on the characters and their struggles. All of the fancy stuff we're seeing is just supplementary to what we're actually focusing on. Brandy O'Daniel back here with the next clip on this React episode, courtesy of today's sponsor, Raycon. Let's just jump into it. Okay, pull up the clip. Yeah, uh, okay, as you can see in this clip, this is the Raycon earbud right here. The first thing you might not know is that Raycon is disrupting the electronics industry by designing premium wireless audio for half the price and without compromise. Raycons offer the same quality as almost any other premium wireless earbud on the market, but for about half the price. Mm, yeah, it does look very comfortable. Yeah, I can see that. It fits right in the ear so conveniently. You can run, you can go to the gym, you can work from home, you can, you can go out and about in these things or just do anything with them. Raycon offers a variety of fun colors and styling options for the earbuds that they have. So you can get them to match with any outfit, any style, any color. Raycon earbuds give you eight hours of playtime per charge and 32 hours of total battery life. They give you seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass. They also have a built-in microphone so you can take any calls that you need, whether you're on the go or whether you're at home. And they come in a compact, convenient carrying case. Raycon also has a 45-day free return policy. So if you don't like what you got, just go ahead and send them back for free. Guys, if you're interested in getting a pair of Raycons for yourself, click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash crew and you will get 15% off your purchase. That's 15% off your purchase by going to buyraycon.com slash crew. Th guys, thanks for letting me do this. I really appreciate it. That was, that was a really fun one. I can't wait till next time when I get to do my, another Jake special here on React. Um, here on Corridor Digital's VFX Artists React. Anyways, till next time. Thank you so much for watching. Hey, guess what? If you liked this and you want to see more of this specific episode, we have an extended cut of this that is on our website, quarterdigital.com. We got, we got a free trial. No big deal. If you like it, great. If you don't, well, you always got us here. Yo, we it's time to goodbye. go. Gonna it's leave time the to say couch. goodbye. See you later. <laughs> there were three, now there's two. It's time for me. See to you guys tie later. My shoe. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. Now there's one little lonely <laughs> Ren. <laughs> oh no, Nico and Sam, they what? got dusted. What? Oh, what Tripod! Happened? What happened to uh, all my friends? <laughs>